Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. We will get started in five minutes. Hello everyone, and thank you all for joining today. Welcome to the NOAA Omics Seminar Series. I'm your host, Nicole Miller, and I sit in NOAA Ocean Exploration. Omics, 
which is a suite of tools used to analyze DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites, has become a large priority here at NOAA in the last few years. We established this seminar series in an effort to increase transparency, collaboration, and highlight the incredible omics-related research currently underway both within and outside NOAA. The seminar series are, these seminar series are made available on our YouTube and posted on our OMICS website. There should be a link in the website in the chat now. As participants, you are muted, but feel free to type questions in the questions for staff box throughout the presentation. At the end, I will read the questions for the presenter to answer. So with that, our presentation today is titled An Introduction to the National Aquatic eDNA Strategy by Dr. Kelly Goodwin. And I will share my screen permissions. Dr. Kelly Goodwin is a marine microbiologist who has led development, validation, application, and technology transfer of molecular biological tools to address NOAA missions, including improved assessment and ecosystem status. Within the NOAA Ocean Exploration Science and Technology Division, she is the portfolio lead for NOAA Omics and serves as the chair of the NOAA Omics Working Group. In these roles, Dr. Goodwin is responsible for providing agency-wide direction with regard to harmonizing integration of bioscience and biotechnology into NOAA research and operations. The goal is to accelerate mission outcomes across a range of national priorities, including employing biomolecular mapping of biodiversity to explore the ocean and to understand and mitigate impacts arising from ecosystem threats, such as climate pollution, disease, and invasive species. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin, for presenting today. I will now Thank pass it off to you. Thank you, Nicole. I would like to acknowledge the co-chairs of the eDNA task team of the Biodiversity Interagency Working Group under SOST, Mike Wiest from ONR, the Office of Naval Research, and Chris Meyer from the Smithsonian. I also acknowledge the co-chairs of the Biodiversity Interagency Working Group, Gabrielle Conico from NOAA and Emmett Duffy from the Smithsonian. During the presentation, I'm going to provide some contextual background before introducing the National Aquatic eDNA Strategy. First off, I'd like to give a shout out to NOAA Omics, which puts on this seminar series. NOAA Omics is guided by the NOAA Omics Strategy and Strategic Plan. The NOAA Omics Working Group is charged with catalyzing implementation of the Strategic Plan, which contains over 20 actions focused on eDNA. You can get a copy of those guidance documents at the NOAA Science Council website, shown at the top right. In addition, they can be obtained at the new NOAA OMICS landing portal, hosted courtesy of NOAA Ocean Exploration. My gratitude goes out to NOAA Ocean Exploration staff for their work on delivering this new website, including Nicole Miller, our host for this seminar series. Please visit the site to check out news stories and sign up for our mailing list, which is open to those outside of NOAA, and you can contact us at noaomics at noaa.gov. Now I'd like to orient you to some vocabulary, starting with the term biomolecules. All life from viruses to whales is built from biomolecules, such as DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites. Techniques from molecular biology or omics are used to detect biomolecules. Environmental DNA or eDNA is a biomolecule, it is the DNA found in the environment. It can be found in water, sediment, and air. The National Aquatic Strategy focuses on water, and because this is a NOAA seminar series, I will focus on marine water. And the detection of eDNA is expanding our ability to explore, monitor, and understand biodiversity. My favorite description of biodiversity comes from the biology ninth grade standard textbook of California, which explains biodiversity as genetic species and ecosystem variety. It specifically describes biodiversity as the genetically based variety of all organisms in the biosphere. And it goes on to explain that biodiversity is one of Earth's greatest natural resources, providing us with food, products, and medicines. 
The importance of biodiversity to ecosystem services is reflected in a growing national demand for biodiversity data. Scientists and managers are increasingly asked for biodiversity data to inform energy development, nature-based climate solutions, the na national nature assessment, and initiatives like America the Beautiful, National Nature Capital, and strategies focused on the bioeconomy and climate. All of these require data on what species and habitats are where, what they are doing, how they might adapt, move, or degrade in the face of significant environment change. And there, there is a need for credible, actionable, and interoperable biodiversity data, given the intertwined challenges of biodiversity loss, social equity, and climate change. For example, a recent report highlighted the vast economic value of the ocean, which values in the trillions of dollars and generation of hundreds of millions of jobs. It also noted that human communities will be affected by the impacts of climate change on marine biodiversity. Now, one area that might not pop into mind when you think about biodiversity or eDNA is the marine microbiome. The marine microbiome consists of viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, etc., that form the base of the food web and that perform critical tasks such as regulating the composition of the atmosphere, recycling nutrients, and decomposing pollutants. Although microbes are tiny, they hold large-scale benefits for sustainable food production and for the health of humans, animals, and ecosystems. Recognition of the critical role of microbes to the Earth system has resulted in growing demand to improve our knowledge of microbial dynamics and to incorporate microbial processes into Earth system models to improve climate change understanding and readiness. Techniques to detect eDNA from bacteria or phytoplankton in the microbiome are being extended to provide biodiversity information for higher trophic levels, such as fish or marine mammals. Through a forensics type approach, DNA available from sloughed and excreted cells can be analyzed without the need to directly capture or biopsy animals. The advantages of eDNA include the ability to sample sensitive and to hard to reach areas, and the ability to monitor biodiversity full, for a full range of trophic levels from a single sample. This non-invasive approach to monitoring aquatic life provides a means for affordable, large-scale biodiversity observations. A key advantage of eDNA is the ease of sample collection. Because only water is needed, eDNA collection is amenable to integration into autonomous platforms. This can augment spatial and temporal sampling to help improve models while combating the high costs of ship time. Internationally, the demand for affordable, large-scale biological observations provided by biomolecular, biomolecular detection is reflected in United Nations Ocean Decade Endorsed Programs such as OBON, the Ocean Bio Biomolecular Observing Network. And another example is OMICBON, which is a thematic biodiversity observing network. These efforts seek to monitor biodiversity at large scale by routinely delivering biological information at the molecular level in order to transform how we sense, protect, utilize, and manage ocean life. And a key goal is the development of autonomous eDNA collection and progress is me being made to develop this observing capability. Internationally, we are building frameworks for collection and sharing of biodiversity information through active roles and input from a multitude of partners. Nonetheless, our knowledge of marine biological diversity remains fragmented. Therefore, the Interagency Working Group on Biodiversity recognized the need for national strategies for both biodiversity and specifically for environmental DNA as well. A national aquatic eDNA strategy is needed because although the demand for biodiversity is broad and eDNA samples are relatively easy to collect, the expertise for sample and data processing is localized within and across agencies. Therefore, national coordination is critical to the production of reliable, incredible, and interoperable data. Shared communication and technical expertise will provide economies of scale and ensure data collection and interpretation that engender public trust. Initially, we set out to focus the strategy on the oceans and the Great Lakes, but federal partners strongly spoke to the need to expand the scope to incorporate all U.S. aquatic waters, 
and currently the national strategy in, will focus on both marine and inland waters. As you can see from this outline of eDNA uses, many federal agencies employ eDNA detection for mission applications, from protecting human health and ecosystem services, to monitoring the efficacy of conservation, environmental assessments, and remediation efforts. The aim of this strategy is to increase federal efficiency and impact by leveraging expertise and lessons learned across these efforts. A few of these, uh, which you see here, involving uh, monitoring harmful mar microbes such as SARS-CoV-2 and wastewater, um, and performing routine analysis and surveillance of harmful algae through environmental assessments and restoration efficacy, which is uh, active for a number of applications, including marine protected areas, wind farms, and coral habitat. Overall, the goal is to provide a source of trusted and interoperable biological data to meet the growing demand for biodiversity information. For examples such as America the Beautiful, the National Nature Assessment, the Arctic Strategy, NOMEC, etc. There are very many. To this end, many agencies and individuals have joined the task of producing a national aquatic eDNA strategy with 16 federal agencies and over 100 individuals involved with the internal review of the draft strategy, which generated hundreds of comments to the draft text. In addition, the public response to the request for information has been immense. We are grateful for the many responses we received to the RFI, which closed on November 30th, 2023. We are working hard to respond to the over 400 lines of feedback we've received. The enthusiasm for this topic is quite impressive. Keep in mind that RFI responses were volunteered without the ability to see draft text. The actual te text will become available after the agency review and approval process is complete. Meanwhile, we can give you an overview of what is in the strategy draft. The strategy is organized into three goals and the vision is listed atop of the slide to harness the power of eDNA to explore, map, monitor, and better understand aquatic life to sustain and restore biological resources into the future. The first goal is to coordinate and communicate to integrate eDNA applications into decision-making. Objectives include establishing a national eDNA coordination body through co-design with partners to develop technical recommendations such as standards and best practices. Also within this goal is the need to provide unified messaging to enhance data interpretation and scientific literacy across all sectors and to co-design action plans to align the national community using the best available science and broad engagement across all sectors. Over the next 10 years, the demand for sample processing throughput is expected to increase at least 100-fold to keep pace with the projected growth in eDNA analytics and to help the federal government meet its monitoring and management responsibilities. Therefore, the second goal is focused on building capacity, infrastructure, and the research and development enterprise needed to employ eDNA observations at large scale. Objectives include building the human capacity via training and education informed by diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility principles in order to bolster, bolster expertise and to address critical issues of US competitiveness and technical leadership. Enhancing infrastructure to meet technical demands that includes everything from national sample repositories to interoperable data management structures. And to support R&D to bolster eDNA science and implementation from basic research through sustained operational observations. The third goal is ambitious to characterize aquatic life in U.S. waters. 
The goal is to operationalize the delivery of biological resource data and provide robust metrics about aquatic health across the nation. Objectives include identifying priority sites and applications via communication and co-design, implementing the technolo technological advances discussed in goal two, from sample collection through processing to create a national biological monitoring framework, and to operationalize delivery of biological resource data to inform actions for protecting and preserving U.S. marine and freshwater ecosystems. The approach to the strategy is concise and high level. Vignettes will be used to communicate use cases. Some examples are shown here, but details will be left to pending implementation plans, which will start um, pretty much immediately after the strategy is released. One aspect of implementation that is highlighted in the strategy document is that need to have that eDNA coordinating body uh, to devise and communicate harmonized technical and communication practices. The vision for that body is two-pronged, one very technical with uh, periodic uh, guidance about technical matters for implementation of eDNA and then the other is more vision and strategy with regard to priority applications and locations, because realistically there are not enough resources for everything to be done everywhere all at once. So we have to figure out how to uh, roll it out in a way that is going to ensure that we go from sample collection to data delivery, delivery that is actionable and useful as quickly as poss possible. So the timeline, um, we've come a long way. The eDNA task team started in January of 2022. And then we spent a lot of time um, engaging stakeholders, uh, which uh, I think was successful given the uh, wonderful response to the RFI. And uh, we put in uh, the RFI, which has since closed, and we are going through that input now. And we are, have gone through uh, two drafts and then we will deliver in early winter uh, to the SOST, um, then to OS OSTP and then public release in time for Capitol Hills Ocean Week and then save the date for the third national workshop on marine eDNA, June 3rd through 7th. Um, and part of that will be stakeholder engagement for the implementation plan. Now, before I go to open to questions, I might, I think both the co-chairs are online and I would like to open up the mic in case they would like to add additional comments. Christopher? Hey, Kelly, or can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Hey, yeah, this is Chris. Um, no, I think you covered it uh, quite well. I think, um, uh, hopefully it leads to some questions here. And I think I just want to highlight that um, the recognition early on um, of the capacity of this kind of information to really democratize biodiversity information and kind of has a lot of power to release um, a lot of information that um, is usually locked up in certain tacit knowledge chains. So um, I think it's a really exciting time. I think people are recognizing that um, and that we can stand, build standards around um, this tool effectively. The other thing we want to make sure is in the process of this that we're not um, locking ourselves into a particular technology or approach. Uh, we want to maintain flexibilities moving forward because we recognize that this is advancing very, very quickly. So I'm um, trying to maintain a balance of um, allowing innovation and flexibility, but also um, coordinating and communicating in consistent ways up and down the chains. I think we think that's really important. Um, if Mike's out there, I don't know if he wants to say anything as well. We don't see that Mike Weiss has joined as a panelist, um, but we will continue. We have a few questions coming into the chat, um, and we can begin to address those. Um, and, and Kelly, feel free to open um, responses to, to Chris as well throughout, throughout the questioning portion of the seminar. So our first question comes from James, 
And James asks if you could elaborate and ex explain what is meant by data being interoperable and also explain the scale um, of, of the strategy itself. He, James asks, um, what scale of observation is large scale? So those are two clarifications. And then we have a few more coming in. I'll take the second part and then I'll have um, Chris take the first part, if that's okay, Chris. So um, the scale is uh, national, meaning uh, you know a national repository of eDNA data. And, and I like to think of this or describe it as um, trying to make a quilt with a with a group and you you know maybe you'd have the you know your quilt block of the month and everyone goes and maybe makes their own block um, and so that might be your regional observations or your local observations but when you come together to make the quilt those blocks had to be within some sort of parameters uh, you know some people can't be making triangles and other people making squares or else the, the quilt won't come together and so the idea is that um, you know, we're going to have data streams that are, are obviously funded from different agencies and different sources, um, but there is the guidance with regard to how data is, how samples are collected, how they're processed, how they're stored, um, and, you know, even down to you know, primer usage and, and, and uh, with any luck, um, access to generalized uh, pipelines for bioinformatic processing and that sort of thing. So that when we start to look at timelines and baselines of uh, change of biodiversity, um, it makes sense that it is interoperable and it is actionable because we know that those baselines of change were being determined in the same way. Um, and, and I'll have Chris add to my response and then he can talk uh, more about the question as well. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, to, to just, as far as scale, you know, again, it, it's not gonna be overnight, we're gonna have a national network. This is gonna bubble up probably through these um, prioritized sites and scale is, is a question of both space and time. And so there's still some work that needs to be done towards research on fate and transport and some other issues there. But again, I, I think the that that question is also related to, again, to this interoperability to make um, different observation nodes to be cross comparable. And I think a big part of the, the interoperability goes towards um, paying attention to standards communities and applying semantic ontologies and language such that um, within agencies, within subgroups, those data uh, have similar inputs and outputs so that they can be aggregated such that the sum is greater than the parts and you can do meta analyses on those. And we're looking towards like the recent agreement that was announced through UNESCO. I, I don't know if it happened at COP, but with uh, USGS and NOAA and um, uh, who was the third party there? I'm brain farting on that one, excuse me, uh, about using OBIS and the US node to sort of have different agencies feed into that data system so that um, everybody can kind of still do what they do as far as their data management. But if they have the data organized and structured in, in consistent ways, we can aggregate that again to, to do meta analyses, to do cross comparisons, to do versioning as sequence variants and reference libraries improve. Uh, to use persistent identifiers is another big aspect um, that so that they can be tracked and resolvable. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're leaning towards as far as interoperability. Uh, the whole gamut of the FAIR principles, you know, um, hope that helps. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kelly. And I do see that Mike has now joined, so we can also direct questions to Mike if necessary. Our next question is from Donald, who mentions, or who asks, um, USFWS and USGS GS have been working on eDNA for quite a while and have effort strategies and SOPs in place 
um, already doing eDNA surveillance and developing genetic markers for priority invasive species. Has the team been working with them as so not to duplicate effort? Absolutely. Uh, it, on that, uh, see, I can go back. Let's see. If we go back to this one. See that the USGS is here is blue um but i don't feel like that really shows uh the contributions that they have made they have actually been absolutely um essential to the writing team and actually to and i have to say the usgs has been part of the uh, of this effort since day one even when uh, the original focus was narrowed to marine and Great Lakes. And the story there is originally we were asked by OSTP to make a national eDNA strategy, meaning everything, air, or sediment, everything. And we said, uh, no, no, thank you. That seems like a lot to do in this short amount of time. So we, you know, politely requested that we narrow the scope, but uh, but but we needed the USGS to, to be uh, you know, just co-founding right from the start, particularly because um, they are implementing ReadyNet um, under the early detection, early response uh, network for invasive species. Um, and, and then through the request of, for example, uh, National Park Service and Fisheries, just that continued request say, you know, basically, look, it's all the same. These needs are the same. We're sharing so much of the same needs. Let's go ahead and expand it to all inland waters. And, and we, we did that um, at the request and the co-design. And um, it has just been an, an amazing opportunity to, to work uh, across um, all these scientists or with all these scientists across the agency. And, um, and the crew is really big. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I don't know if Mike has, uh, if Mike or Chris have anything else to add. Kelly, I think you stated it well. This is Mike. Thanks. Um, I, I just to reiterate, I, I think they, USGS folks were uh, definitely the drivers in, in helping us recognize that if we did expand to, to aquatic beyond just marine and Great Lakes, that that we could wrap our arms around it. So I think they were instrumental in in helping kind of set that vision and and really identify key partners as well. That was uh, you know part of it is you know being, bringing on a, a number of additional agencies and figuring out who are the key people in those agencies to to engage with. Um, so I, I'd say USGS really facilitated. Kind of expanding that vision and, and being able to to connect with the the key people in those agencies from Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, you you name it. So, um, yeah. So great interactions with USGS. Thanks, Kelly, and thank you, Michael. Our next question is from Amy, who says, "Thank you very much, or thank you for this. How do you see eDNA observations being integrated?" stored and accessible with other types of aquatic environmental data that might be collected concurrently. Um, for example, temperature, salinity, pH, met or metabolomics data. Uh, thank you for that question. And I I, uh, I guess I have been speaking to the choir too long that I didn't make that more obvious that, you know, such a huge driver for this is this, um, not only fragmentation of, in some ways, when I had talked about fragmentation of biodiversity data, that is one component of that fragmentation. Um, and there's fragmentation of different ways to obtain biodiversity data, you know, whether that's you know, video or acoustics, but there's the, um, the fragmentation of sequence data from their critical metadata sequences in a vacuum just are sequences in a vacuum it's not actionable information and so in what you see now in this national strategy you know, the u.s is joining many nations um, that have already published national strategies on edna and that is you know in some ways on on the uh, coattails of international efforts such as the genomic standards consortium and the all all the different efforts um, I, uh, 
to make sure that metadata um, uh, it stays connected to sequence data. Um, and so that will be a big part of the implementation plan. Um, I can say that NOAA is working really hard to, to move us into a guided framework so that people know how to do that, even if they're coming in as novice users. And we're going to be rolling out a data management guidance um, in, in February to help not just the scientists, but program managers who may be new coming into the field to know things that um, you know, people who are molecular biologists know because it's handed down as part of their education and training, but that we're, we're sort of grown past that as a method of delivering information and we have to find a way to make it easy to do that. And, and again, I'll, I'll give it to the co-chairs because you know, we're not alone in this, you know, OBIS and, and GBIF are, are really working to make this happen as well. Thank you, Kelly. Michael, Chris, any any comments on um, uh, just on that? just a, a quick follow up on that. Um, I you know we we have a kind of a, a bit of a smaller group that's meeting a little bit on this, and there's I think within NOAA, I think somebody out there correct me if I'm wrong. The ERDAP system has been used to track a lot of time series kind of in contextual information. And these data are going to be a little different because they're kind of snapshots cut out of that space-time continuum. But I think using that similar model and um, again towards that interoperability, if we have these conform to the various standards communities, whether the uh, the MIX standard out of the Genomic Standards Consortium, TADWIG, um, uh, various uh, um, Darwin Core, Dublin Core events tracking, uh, will allow agencies to both uh, distribute their information, what they choose to put into something like an OBIS or a GEOBIS, but then also on the back end harvest others' information back out to lay it into their own context as well, I think. So again, I, I see it a bit as a two-way street, both in mapping your, maybe you don't have a CTD associated with, with somebody close to you did, so you can use a voxel of space time to kind of backtrack that and interpolate to some degree as long as you have that X, Y, Z, T coordinates in there. And, and I would like to add a, that two-way street comment. You know, for those of you that are on the call, um, it, it's really easy to talk about metadata standards and all kinds of standards sitting in front of your computer. And it's, it's really hard when you're out in the environment and it's, you're cold and you're wet and your fingers aren't working. And and so we you know, we need we need to find things that you know thread that needle between you know, being doable in, in for the real people on the ground, but also inspire people to really understand how important that these da this data management effort is. Um, it's not easy, or we wouldn't be talking about it. And and we've been talking about it for years. So two-way street there as well. Kelly, and thanks, Chris. Our next question comes from Cece, who, who states, thanks for the overview. Can you clarify further, or can you further clarify how the response responses to the RFI will be used in the strategy, will be used if the strategy has already been drafted? Where does the RFI fit into the development process timeline for the strategy? Uh, well, so here we are. So it's just the first draft. We are we are frantically responding to those now, and they the RFI uh, input will be fully implemented um, by this January February draft. So these internal drafts, um, you know, were, were first cuts. And just remember that we kind of we have been engaging with the community for a while. So it isn't like we made the draft in a vacuum without hearing voices. Um, and I can say that so far, luckily out of those 400 lines of information, many, many of those comments were things that we had that are in the strategy. I am very relieved to, to have, have seen that. Um, 
And so it's not going to be, it, it's actually not going to be that hard to respond to the RFI input because, because of this amount of time I felt like that we made on the ground engaging and listen, listening um, before the RFI even hit the streets. Um, so the RFI uh, will, uh, will completely be um, incorporated and reviewed and implemented into this January, February. And then you can see we have uh, quite a bit more of internal review that happens um, before we get to June. Our next question comes from Steve, who, oh, Michael, did you have uh, any other comments? I was just going to chime in, thanks, uh, and, and just also say um, there's a tremendous amount of feedback. Um, some of it is kind of direct to this, the strategy that we're already addressed or we can address and will in this next draft. And, and then there's quite a bit of feedback, too, that really is for implementation. So we're, we're dividing that out if, if it's not going to be used um, in the writing of the draft of the strategy, we've still got that input then that we can use as we begin writing implementation plans. Yes, thank you for saying that, because I, I do want to reiterate that most likely all of you on the call today are, are, are not the audience of the strategy. The strategy is, is very much you know, leadership who are not going to be, um, even biologists in any way, shape, or form. And so that the strategy text is is very high level and the implementation plan, which we'll still have to go through an approval process, but that's where we can really spend time on details. And and you know, for example, I had thought about putting in a um, a word jar penalty. You know, every time you add a word to the strategy, you put a dollar in the jar. Um, and, and we actually did litmus tests, which is sit and read it and if you can't read it in one sitting then it's not going to get used so um keep in mind that it is it is not for an academic audience in any way shape or form all right thank you mike for your comments our next question is from steve who asks how are decision and policy makers reliant on edna data or by edna um or rely on eDNA by NOAA. So I, I think that is to reiterate how are decision and policymakers reliant on eDNA. So uh, I'm going to go up to the slide so you can see here. Um, so I would say you know right now a lot of eDNA is is, is research efforts. Um, with regard to function of an ecosystem, um, the applications are huge. Okay, so I'll do this in two parts. So where we're going is this new national demand and an international demand for biodiversity data. And um, if you haven't done so, I encourage you to Google some of these terms, terms, the National Nature Assessment and the National Nature Capital in particular are very um, large and compelling initiatives to have actionable layers of biodiversity data. Like that, you know, they won't really want to know in in a way that is accountable what's going on for biodiversity and these are relatively new things that federal agencies are going to be on the hook for so these are our emerging requirements for federal agencies other emerging requirements include things like biodiversity credits and markets for example um, uh, mdcr marine carbon dioxide removal actions debt for conservation swaps. These are all things in where people want to know, take it to the bank, literally take it to court. What's going on for biodiversity? Is it going up, down, changing, those sorts of things. So those are emerging examples. And then in this slide, I went through, these are just some examples that are already being used. Um, in, in which decisions are being made. And, and so, you know, using wastewater to look for uh, a pathogen that causes COVID illness, 
NOAA has now moved into routine operations um, using qPCR for surveillance of harmful algae for decision making on when to um, you know additionally treat or close water intakes in the Great Lakes. Uh, invasive species decisions looking for front ends of invasive species um, uh, ocean exploration routinely using eDNA to explore ocean depths. Uh, fisheries assessments moving into routine research on um, uh, using eDNA for understanding uh, stocks and, and the movement of those stocks in face of climate change. Huge amounts of biodiversity monitoring associated with trying to understand what species are doing in the face of change. Um, and then things uh, including um, using eDNA to inform assessments, uh, whether those are NEPA assessments and that sort of thing. And, and that goes back to these vignettes as well. And all of these vignettes are places in which um, eDNA is, is being used and we expect eDNA utilization to expand. Particularly, I like this, the value, evaluate management action. I think is is where a lot of that demand is is wanting something and wanting metrics of whether um, <clears throat> a restoration uh, action worked or not. Um, Mike or Chris? I think you covered it well. Yeah, you did it well. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, we have a question next from Jesse who asks, are there any thoughts about how to get started on the national eDNA survey? Perhaps this will be a topic at the conference in June 2024. I think you're saying, <clears throat> how do we start to get the work done for the goal three? Yes. That, right. Goal three. How, how do we characterize aquatic yeah. life in U.S. waters? <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, uh, I will let everyone speak to this. I think realistically, it's built on the backbones of, of um, current programs. So on the inland waters, um, the USGS has funding under the um, bilateral, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill to set up ReadyNet. That is, uh, I think, a good, I, I feel confident in laying money that that's going to be a key pillar to this overall goal three. Um, and so, and then you can imagine all those other things I, I showed in those vignettes and those use cases, um, those are going to realistically be the, the backbones because we're not going to just start from nothing. We're going to build out from uh, you know, current infrastructure and, and then recognize those gaps and and uh, and then and then obviously I mean let, let's be honest new resources are going to be needed there's not enough resources to to magically do this right now so we'll put the building blocks together and um, seek to find the resources to uh, uh, stitch the quilt together Mike and Chris Um, well, I just, I would just, you know, network building and uh, doing that is can can come in many forms. It can happen within your um, your agencies or institutions. Can cut across, you know, laboratories and observation sites. Uh, I think, you know, if we want to be uh, inclusive and expansive on this, we can look towards what the Japanese are doing with their anemone program and engaging uh, communities and and um, participatory um, science because there's just we need to we'll be able to mo we'll need to be able to mobilize a coalition of the willing if we need to fill the gaps towards that but i think it's going to get built initially on again like like kelly said sort of existing infrastructure where we have um because you still have to take a sample you know that's still sample limited this is not remote sensing it's scalable with automation but i think we'll learn a lot by just kind of simplifying best practices and, and allowing for engagement. I think a quick way people could start to do it is, you know, there are um, uh, demonstration modules for get, if you have eDNA profiles, um, you can start 
uh, thinking about working with um, and, and modifying your information to get it towards these uh, OBIS and GBIF ingestion tools. So I think that's, that's a potential place where just start putting it out there and seeing what it starts looking like. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, and there is now a course to do OBIS, and another place to look, um, I kind of went over this, but um, also uh, everyone you know, is, is is involved in these UN Decade um, sorts of things, particularly OBON, Marine Life 2030, OMIC Bond, and it's the same sort of concept, except here they're all marine, but you know, this sort of meta observatory where you're just putting all the pieces together to make a larger whole. Um, I think what will be very challenging for us now that we have increased the scope to all types of US waters, um, which also increased the scope to all kinds of applications, um, you will have to really see how how that's going to work. I rather imagine that you see these you know communities of practice. You know, there's you know within invasive species, and then um, you know within sort of general biodiversity versus you know pathogens, those sorts of things. But there's just not enough expertise to go around to to just silo off by ourselves. So the goal is to really have people together and um, making sure that we're sort of marching to the same drum and we can be playing different instruments, but when it comes together, we want it to be, you know, an orchestra piece. And so really the idea is that the strategy is that conductor so that when it all comes together, it makes sense and it's a, um, a more um, rich and vibrant whole than if it was just the instruments playing by themselves. Great analogy there, Kelly. Well, one thing I wanted to chime in too is uh, with a lot of the applications, there, there's a lot of things that are, are shovel ready, if you will, you know, ready to go out and, and be able to do. Then there are some things, you know, I, I run the marine mammal program at ONR. So going out and using this, you know, in, in looking for, you know, target species that are relatively rare, like marine mammals, I think there's, as we go to kind of co-design and, and look at these priority sites, I think we're gonna to look to piggyback, you know, with a lot of existing effort. Um, for instance, a lot of the research, you know, currently um, is, is partnering, you know, with acoustic surveys. So um, visual and acoustic surveys um, or acoustic sites. So you can do these kind of head-to-head -head comparisons and compare what you're getting, validate what you're getting. Um, so I think that'll be a key part is, in, particularly as we move to the upper tropic levels and, and larger scales. Um, and, and, and I think Chris mentioned earlier, um, some of the key information that's developing are, are things like the feet and transport. So when we get a detection, um, we can understand, you know, what that means. And it's, it's not unlike passive acoustics if you get a detection or visual ops for that matter. Um, so we just have to really understand what that means. And, and I think that co-design with some of the existing effort will be a big part of it, particularly for the, the larger, um, more rare kind of ESA related species. Over. Thanks. Thank you, Mike and Kelly for that response. We have time for one more question, um, maybe two. This question comes from Lindsay who asks, given the large gaps in genetic library, large gaps in genetic libraries, how do you overcome deficiencies in these deficiencies in the short term? Yay, I'm so glad I get to go to my extra slides. <laughs> Thank you for asking that, Lindsay. I didn't put this in because I was afraid I have time. So um, I have a couple extra slides, right? So uh, so one is this idea of, you know, wh why are we talking about this? Because this is big data. And, um, and so, I'll, uh, this is leading up to the other part um, and this idea of, of dark taxa. And so the answer is we have to sequence um, tissues as well. Um, and that, and we really, you know, part of this, and this is in the strategy, is this, you know, that eDNA is not orphaned from the organisms themselves. And we understand that the databases are not complete. And so 
there is a a specific call out to this you know, need uh, to to sequence things. So thank you for that question. My chance to to dip into my extra slides. Chris, you probably would like to put in put in a yeah. word on this account. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just that it's a great question. Obviously, as we can sequence whatever now, we're realizing what we don't know. And um, we feel confident based on, you know, the stuff we've done in different demonstration sites and using these different techniques that we can kind of disappear these dark taxa because we can go back into those habitats and look for the unknowns. We kind of aren't looking for needles in haystacks anymore. We kind of know when they're likely to show up to get a voucher for something. I mean, rare species are always going to be problematic, but we, we need enough of that diversity space sampled so we can scaffold the unknowns onto it so we can bring some natural history information to it um, the and we just have to be really careful about our annotations too and how we are um, calling sequence reads particular things uh, it, it's going to you know sometimes there's consensus issues where there's no variation between tax and we have to be aware of that so it's not just completely unknowns but but um, too much sequence similarity. We shouldn't be making calls one way or another on certain things. So um, the Smithsonian is, is actively pursuing this with a new initiative called Ocean DNA and looking for partners because it will take a, a whole global effort to source those missing taxa across um, the different taxonomic domains. But again, with new sequencing technologies, we're getting better and better at unlocking existing connections with you know, shallow shotgun sequencing or genome skimming and things like that. So uh, some of the sequencing capacities, and we're going to be able to to dig into a lot of um, existing voucher collections to kind of upregulate um, our knowledge base on that front. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for that, and Kelly as well. We have one last question for today by Beth, who asks, when, and this is a great segue. Um, what kinds of ground truthing measures associated with eDNA collections will be included in the strategy? Do plans exist to standardize these types of metadata as well? And I believe you just both alluded to that slightly in the last question, but if you wanted to go into a little bit more detail, that will be our last question for today. So I'll start with yes, and then hand, hand it over to Mike. Oh, and the, the ground oh, truth. Sorry, so I hand it over to Chris. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I think, um, you know, I mean, you know, I think that, that part of this, you know, every sampling technique has its strengths and weaknesses. They're all different nets, uh, and certain things are better at seeing other things in, in various other aspects. So I think um, there are already a handful, like Mike mentioned, the, the paired stuff with acoustics. There's uh, co-visual survey kind of stuff that, um, I think Zach, I don't know if Zach's on the call, Gold's been doing with inside and outside MPAs. Um, you know, there's there's a suite of um, of these kind of uh, known empirical testing too, with um, known amounts and traces, tracing. I, but as far as, to, I don't wanna be too prescriptive though in this strategy. I think we definitely call out the need for more of those kind of paired sampling tests. Um, experiments. So Mike, do you want to say anything towards that from uh, your end of the spectrum? Yeah, I, I think it's um, the way we think about it in Navy is kind of where the, on the research side and kind of what's operational in that transition from one, one to the other. So again, I think there's a lot of methods that are, are tried and true and, and ready for implementation. And then there, there are other applications you know, open ocean again, rare targets like marine mammals, where we do need to really kind of understand and ground truth. And so I think that, um, you know, as we move through those various use cases like the rare targets, um, I think that that's where in implementation or, or through this coordination council, um, you know, national coordinating body, right? I think that's where we can identify some of those those needs. So th that might be more of a research need where we still need to ground truth particular applications. So that might be where uh, a number of agencies who have that common interest might get together and you know put together a not topic 
um, to really push research and innovate in, in that particular area. So I, I think we've got the room for that and we you know call that out in the strategy and we can be more specific in the implementation. But ongoing, I think that uh, national coordinating body will be a, a critical body to identify those needs as they arise for, for various applications. But I think that ground truthing is, is critical. Um, um, you know, as we move to operationalize and, and want to start using, you know, these outcomes in decision making, like we talked about earlier. And I'll, I'll just add that that in this process, you know, there's there's a push pull with the international community. Um, you, you know, for those of you familiar with, you know, OBIS GBIF divides on these little details and the devils in the details, and and um, and, and increasing our workforce capacity we are trying to bring in people who who can do this type of data management you know that it it is not realistic to make everyone do it the same way it is realistic to devise scripts to translate between um ways of doing things because just people are you know, have historical necessity to keep doing things in a particular way and so we're working on making these tools so that you can you know go from an NCBI to an OBIS to a GVIF to an ERDAP, you know, back and forth. Um, but it, it does seem, I mean, my personal opinion, it does seem more complicated than it needs to be. Um, but I, I think we've gotten to the point that, that you know, trying to encourage people to follow the same path up the mountain, but at the same time realizing that, that there just has to be ways to translate between different paths as well. And, and Kelly, if I can just add one one last plug here, um, I think you know to go back to the interoperability and and data being more structured and born ready. I think we're going to be really surprised by the power of AI and machine learning as it comes down the pipes here. And if these data are are out there, they're going to find patterns in predictive ways that that even a person isn't going to be able to do. But we also have to be wary of the biases in training any of those systems up. So, um, but I do I do think that um, these kind of data are going to be very amenable to uh, approaches towards big data. Uh, agreed. And luckily, you know, this, this is, you know, we're a part of an international community. Um, and this, uh, I think, is particularly true um, in the marine space because you know we share the ocean, right? And so you know it, it, there's just a lot of international coordination um, from that from that perspective. And so there is a big push under you know UNESCO and UN type of initiatives to even have things at the protocol level be machine readable um, to as a path towards interoperability, meaning that it's not an individual somehow tweaking is that that there's code behind the scenes that are able to translate things to make them interoperable. Thank you, Kelly Goodwin for presenting today. Thank you, Michael Weiss and Christopher Meyer um, for your help answering questions um, and for all of your efforts for this National Aquatic eDNA Strategy. With that, um, that concludes our seminar today. Thank you everybody for attending the NOAA OMIC seminar series occur monthly and you can register for future seminars by visiting the NOAA OMICS website currently located in the chat. Thank you Kelly, Michael and Christopher for your time today and thank you everybody for joining.